Hi, good evening to everyone. Uh, I've got the honor to be the first to give my lecture. Uh, and it has been super nice to be here in Latvia. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really grateful and appreciate it. And it was quite a pleasure to see all these new buildings at, and get more acquainted with the Latvian architecture and also with Latvian architects. Uh, my name is Kaja Vae. I'm uh, from Estonia. Uh, uh, to a little bit uh, introduce me, I was trained as an architect and I also studied physics. Uh, I've been practicing architects for, for several years and uh, then I organized, then I worked in the Estonian Center of Architecture where I organized the uh, workshops about the public space of Estonia, what is going to be the future of Estonian public space. There were really interesting discussions. Uh, recently I've been for five years uh, editor-in-chief of Estonian architectural magazine Maya. I hope some of you have heard about it. I'm also teaching at the Estonian Academy of Arts. And uh, last uh, week I switched my position, so now I'm working in the Ministry of Economics uh, as a head of uh, construction and housing department. <laughs> so, uh, but my talk is about really challenging theme. Uh, it was a long research for me, almost uh, seven years. And why I'm speaking about this uh, is that I know that all the Latvian, all the uh, public states uh, have the same uh, challenges with this uh, prefabricated Soviet modernist uh, uh, housing areas. And uh, if you look at these areas, basically, nothing has changed there since Estonia has gained independence. There, just the number of the cars has increased, but no other changes, basically. Uh, but why it is important? Uh, actually, 30% of Estonians are living in this kind of areas. Uh, but we, were com we completely had no idea what to do with these kind of areas and how to raise the quality of space. Uh, so, uh, we started this process in uh, 2011, uh, and as you all must know, this is a, some sort of bundle of problems. It's basically difficult to understand what, which problems are architectural, which problems you can solve by architecture, but which ones are social problems, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, this is Annelin. Uh, in Tartu, uh, this is not collage. This is a real picture. <laughs> so maybe you now understand my challenge. For me, it was like an enigma to solve something, to solve it and to do something. Because we're always dreaming about uh, these areas. We have lots of utopian uh, vision competitions and so on, but nothing ever gets done. So I was sort of obsessed to find a solution. But the problem was <laughs> quite clearly defined. <laughs> uh, just to show the environment. And uh, this is the city of Tartu, the borders. And uh, this is Annelin, where uh, also 30% of the uh, Tartu's uh, citizens are living there. So uh, this is the densest area in the sense of uh, inhabitants per square kilometer. And this also gives a one good reason to work with these areas because the investments are most effective. Uh, as a dual, as there are a bundle of uh, challenges uh, with, these kinds of, with, with these kind of areas. You probably know them, but just to uh, go over weak social relations, stigmatization, segregation, poor quality of everything. Uh, but uh, Perhaps the most, uh, most crucial problem is uh, actually the lack of articulation of uh, space in terms of private, semi-public and public space. And uh, if uh, Soviet uh, countries imported this idea of the free plan uh, from France, uh, what was skipped were skipped the uh, uh, 
uh, collective areas in the buildings. In a student, there are only the apartments in, in this, uh, this kind of houses. And actually, uh, the idea, where is the public and semi-public spaces, it's, it's, it's not uh, totally, uh, it's not uh, thought about. Uh, what is interesting that in Estonia there are two architects, uh, Malemelak and uh, Mart Port, uh, who actually designed all these areas. There are uh, three in Tallinn, Mustama, Lasnama, Väikeoisma, maybe you have been there. Uh, one in Tartu and uh, quite a number in another smaller towns. Uh, but uh, what is really interesting, uh, reading the, the discussions and the protocols of the discussions, and uh, unfortunately they were dead if I started with the process, but uh, speaking to their colleagues, it uh, quite quickly came out that uh, for these people actually the planning was like an uh, interesting challenge and this uh, plan was something to think about and to be creative because the houses were typical, there were no challenge for the architect, but uh, working with the, with the uh, general plans were for them really interesting thing. Uh, and as a result, uh, in a big scale, these areas are actually uh, rather nicely thought out. Uh, but we never noticed them because only the houses were built and not the public space. So we actually don't, don't really clearly see the potentials of the public spaces and the possible uh, connections and so on, what we could actually implement there. And uh, it is really possible to find the continuous and connected spaces uh, with the potential of uh, really va valuable uh, public spa space uh, if, you, if you really look uh, at the original plans. And when these guys, uh, Malla Melak and uh, Mart Porta, started uh, with their work, uh, the first uh, general plan they did was Mustama. Uh, and they did it according to the Soviet planning norm and as a result the structure of the uh, uh, district was uh, homogeneous, really vague and chaotic. And Mart Port, who was very good in uh, expressing himself, said that Mustama does not give uh, crew laurels for us either directly or indirectly. So people are really dissatisfied with this area. Uh, and this is the structure of uh, Mustama. Uh, originally it was planned for 100,000 people, now there are 65,000 inhabitants. Uh, this is Vaiko Isma, also in Tallinn. Uh, and this is Lasnama uh, in Tallinn. And you quite clearly see that the general plans are advancing. And now let's go back again to Annelin, to Tartu. Uh, this was the first uh, competition entry for them, for the master plan of uh, Annelin. And here they already uh, worked with the idea not to make it too homogeneous. Here the uh, buildings are concentrated to make a more tense space. Uh, and uh, these are the pedestrian areas, what they called the rays, and this is meant uh, like a public and recreational area. So it's totally crazy one. <laughs> uh, if they started, uh, this is also the competition entry, uh, the view from the public area towards the apartment buildings. Um, nice graphics. And if they started to work uh, with a project, uh, they made these kind of models. Uh, and it was meant like uh, almost nearly to 50,000 inhabitants. At the moment there are 27 or nearly 30,000. Uh, and for them the main concept of the layout of, layout of uh, Annelin was were these uh, pedestrian areas where there no cars entered these areas. This one they called the arch and this one they called the race. 
uh, and they had this concept that uh, these are the really lively public uh, spaces. Uh, actually, the rays were meant to be really la uh, lively because, as I mentioned, here is the public uh, functions. And uh, they even wrote that the intense life activity lasts from early morning until late at night, <laughs> which is not the case at the moment, surely. Um, uh, and uh, these are these rays, uh, which are built in a really low quality, only the asphalt, basically. And, and this is the arch. Uh, the center of uh, Tartu is, is somewhere here. If we, if we speak in, the, in terms of this uh, picture. Um, and these are the uh, more detailed uh, drawings of uh, this uh, race where they uh, tried to uh, design these uh, public spaces which were meant to be so lively. <laughs> but this, of course, was never built. Uh, this is the real situation. Um, from the 70s. And if I look at this picture, it makes me always laugh because nowadays they, these areas are crowded with cars, basically. But no cars problem at all in the beginning. And uh, these areas were planned uh, according to norm 200 uh, cars per inhabitants, but now in Estonia it's more than uh, two times bigger the number. And this is uh, also one of the problems. Uh, and basically, I think uh, speaking in the terms of uh, quality of space, the big, biggest problem is that it's really vague. Uh, there is no clear function, not divine, divi defined enough, too much freedom, and no articulation between private, semi-public, and uh, public space. Uh, and you, I've already hinted a bit uh, that we have been working with this kind of areas in the terms of uh, quarters. And I would call it as a quarter demon because we are somehow trying to turn them into normal city quarters, uh, which hasn't functioned very well. And at the same time, architect in me who is looking for the novelty, I'm all, in, in a way, I'm feeling a bit bad if we try to change them into normal closed quarters because the qualities of free plan, more air, more light, are real qualities. And maybe we somehow still can achieve this articulation of private, semi-private, semi-public, public, public uh, space without these uh, fences and making the quarters. Uh, and there is lots of space, is a clear potential. And as I already mentioned, the really high uh, population density. Lots of people, lots of space. It's like a <laughs> fairy tale for the architect, but somehow so difficult to solve. Um, and yeah, there's a one uh, clear aspect that, as, as I told, 30% uh, of the Estonians are living in this kind of areas, and, and money-wise speaking, uh, it's not possible to build so many new houses. We have to renovate them, actually, and do something with them. Uh, and uh, as I told, it was a long process uh, with the aim to do something finally. And it was quite clear that we need to start inventing tools uh, to handle it in another way or in a novel way. And this is actually lots of different events, uh, lectures, workshops, uh, and other kind of activities. I won't go through them all. But here you can basically see the time span we, we discussed with uh, different people, uh, not only with the residents, but uh, people with the from the different uh, professions, worked with artists, uh, and so on, and with all the stakeholders, basically. Um, uh, the first uh, move to do was to create this uh, simple web page uh, because these areas, could, uh, you can say that they are stigmatized because people actually don't see the history and layers of uh, this kind of areas. But just to, to share this uh, interesting material and interesting uh, 
photos and so on with people, it's just something you can do uh, with to start to grow the consciousness of the residents. Uh, we asked people to send photos, uh, but uh, what was clear and noticed that there were no pictures of the space, only of people. So space was worth not to, not worth to uh, photograph. Then we had an uh, architecture flash lecture. I don't know if you have heard about it, but there is a certain series of architecture lectures in Estonia. What does it mean to be contemporary? Because we clearly had to ask how to bring this kind of areas into modern day because they are not very much connected into the modern day yet. You can put it this way. And the, the philosopher, literary scholar, urban geographer, semitician and philosopher uh, participated. And uh, this is interesting, oh sorry. Uh, this guy is uh, the literary scholar, and there is a well-known um, novel in Estonia called Autumn Ball, and uh, he said that uh, actually people start, and Autumn Ball is about uh, Mustama, uh, the same place, and uh, he said that uh, people started to speak about the Mustama even uh, then, if uh, the novel was written about it, before nobody noticed it. Um, this is the picture also of the uh, uh, lecture series. Uh, we did uh, the work with the uh, artists and, and writers and there are some, some of the works. So all kind of people <laughs> basically <laughs> participated. Uh, to, to share the ideas. And uh, one really funny thing we did uh, to raise the consciousness was the uh, leaflet. Uh, we printed basically 14,000 leaflets and set, sent it to each of the address uh, in Annelin. And uh, it's basically introduced the city government plans, the ideas that could be developed uh, in cooperation between the apartment association and municipality, uh, how to discover the surroundings of Annelina because there is a really interesting nature, and also the introduction of this uh, web page. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it was like the propaganda to <laughs> acknowledge you about the special issues. Uh, there is a one small uh, project with a flower bed, uh, which uh, we started, but but the locals uh, joined. Uh, and basically, <laughs> this is very nice guy. He put here the sign saying that this is the uh, flower bed for every citizen in Annelin, and everybody has to take care of it. <laughs> and as a result, this was, it was really nicely taken care of. <laughs> uh, then, this is one my project, which was part of the Venice Biennale in 2016, part of the uh, Baltic Pavilion. Uh, these were sort of uh, leaflets uh, to, to give to residents ideas what could be done in this kind of space. So it was a sort of allegory. During Soviet times there were also the leaflets or the propaganda leaflets which uh, tried to teach you how to be a better person or something like that. So this was also a bit ironical project perhaps. Uh, but uh, also it was meant to raise, just to perhaps to invigorate the fantasy how to use uh, this kind of spaces. Uh, so, <laughs> um, and uh, one part of this process was the vision, vision competition. Uh, and the task of the vision competition uh, was exactly to find, to specify the central area of Annelin, uh, which could be the center of, or the backbone of the uh, public space, and also how to create the social bonds between uh, residents. Uh, and, and of course, uh, to do something, uh, we decided to work with the, uh, the space areas are uh, 
uh, the municipalities plots and white ones uh, are private. So this is one reason what makes also very difficult to work with this kind of various uh, this uh, owners issue. Uh, but we we kept as a central uh, challenge sti still these uh, pedestrian areas uh, to think about them as a, as a main uh, public space uh, because uh, they also, uh, as I told, belong to city and so the city can actually do something and, and show the uh, good uh, example uh, and to provoke perhaps uh, bring in a future another investments in this area. So these are how these uh, pedestrian areas looked uh, before. Um, how much time I have? Because, do you know? <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> Because I really can uh, speak for days, but uh, I try to be as quick as possible, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, this was about uh, emphasizing the role of the municipality to, uh, to be a, some sort of good example or the initiator for the changes. Uh, we got uh, three winners that we uh, st uh, continued the work with. It was like a two-stage uh, competition. Uh, most of us, we of course, were interested uh, with these uh, pedestrian areas, and uh, and one of the winners uh, exactly were thinking about just to. Here are the uh, public buildings, like the schools and the libraries, and uh, how to somehow. Um, uh, enlarge this uh, public space and and to uh, to hook the public buildings also into this uh, close to next to this um, uh, uh, pedestrian arch. Uh, just some drawings about it, uh, and of course, uh, if we come back to the cars, uh, this is also partly gives a solution to this uh, car problem because uh, this area is a uh, like, uh, very good connection for the uh, inhabitants with the city center, which is somewhere here. Um, uh, so one of the teams worked uh, with the uh, overall road structure and they found like this mudways, like something really specific uh, to this kind of areas and they <laughs> draw this wonderful net uh, to acknowledge it. Uh, different activities, which are, there is a, clearly the lack of activities. Uh, this is just the one drawing of this uh, pedestrian arch with this uh, activity pocket, how they called it. Um, the activity pocket again, <laughs> uh, another activity pocket. Uh, I go them quickly through. Uh, there were of course lots of ideas and also the designs about the courtyards, but I won't. I will skip them mainly because uh, it would take too much. But a really good idea was to move the cars uh, uh, away from the uh, vicinity of the houses. Uh, this is also the courtyard, and there is a really the problem of uh, locality. How to make it feel? Pro, uh, diversified or, or that all the microrayons have some sort of specific face or feature or something like that. Actually, it's quite clear that the small elements are missing and every small element that is, add, is added is quite nicely and warmly welcomed. There were also the project about the urban gardening, I mainly skipped them also. Uh, and finally, as a really long process and lots of people were uh, uh, involved in this process, everybody were quite uh, convinced that the idea to develop this uh, pedestrian arch is a, is a good idea. Uh, and finally, the cost of the project was 1.5 uh, million euros, which is really low, and uh, all this arch was uh, renovated and, and uh, established as a new uh, public space. So here are the pictures of the, uh, this arch, and you can have their meal, play chess, maintain a bike, skateboard, climb, whatever, 
all, kind, all this kind of activities. And also the project was very conscious about the uh, historical layers. This is the Soviet era garage, so it was totally preserved. Um, this, these kind of buildings. And also the bus stops. <laughs> So, uh, as it is on the people's everyday path, it's uh, really in uh, intense use. Um, and to summarize this project, the, uh, it was constructed in uh, 2017. And if you look at the real estate advertisements, then they always mention that this is next to this uh, pedestrian arch. And actually even the um, cost of the uh, uh, mm, apartments have raised uh, next to the uh, arch. So, in a way, you might say that it is perhaps a simple or even naive or not so complicated project, but uh, as you recall, my uh, aim was sort of uh, solve this enigma and, and find a way how we actually can do something. And this was like an interesting, interesting first step, but it all took uh, all together six years and uh, lots of events and, and lots of people to involve and, and speak to. Uh, but uh, still, I believe that to summarize it, uh, the small objects and small scale uh, stuff are always welcome there. Uh, don't work at the scale of quarter, it's like uh, cursed uh, scale, <laughs> work uh, in the scale of the general plan and try to find what are the potentials there because these guys really think in the sense of, uh, in the sense of peak scale, how to implement all this uh, kind of uh, public spaces there. They unfortunately were never built. Uh, but uh, in today's, in contemporary term, you can really find the values and build them in a really modern sense because it's quite clear that you can't plan anymore in so big scale, so clearly and so detailed way. And these uh, pedestrian are, are areas, they are simply pedestrian areas. They don't intervene with the cars. So uh, people also say that it's uh, super safe for the children. Uh, and yeah, also I, I think that lots of new tools are still to be invented to work with this kind of areas. But thank you. I still, I think we continue. Just, or if you have questions, I can do it quickly, but. <laughs> Pardon? Thanks. Okay, okay. Okay, I'll take Thank you. Is this, uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Perfect. Hello everyone, my name is Henry Glogau. I'm a New Zealand architect, uh, but currently working and living in Copenhagen, Denmark for the last five years at a company called 3XN GXN. Uh, this is my first time in Latvia, so it's been ex super exciting to travel around with the jury members and see some, some pretty incredible projects along the way. So when trying to think about sort of a project or a presentation that I could speak about today, which had a little bit of connection to some of the projects that we saw around uh, renovation, um, uh, reuse of existing structures. I thought a, a, a nice topic to talk about and something that is uh, quite close to my heart and passion is around circular design and how we can harness a lot of the waste of today for the building materials and architecture of tomorrow. Uh, a little bit about the company that I work at. Uh, we're a global company based in Copenhagen but have offices in New York, Sydney, London and Stockholm. We work uh, across a variety of different areas within architecture, landscape, all the way through research, innovation, interior products, and also sort of publications and graphics. Um, so yeah, this is our office space where it's an old converted boat shed in, in central Copenhagen, which we've then turned into uh, yeah, quite, a, quite a nice uh, office environment. 
There's around 110 of us in the Copagan office. Um, but how we divide it up is there's, under the same roof, uh, a few different types of things going on. We have the competition department. We have very much the, the project development area. But then what I think is quite unique and uh, for us is that we have a research uh, department and material lab, which is where uh, the company that I'm working for called GXN. And so there's about 25 of us working at GXN. Um, and the kind of exciting thing is that we look at the way that research can really start to inform uh, practice. And I think one thing that we do is we don't just hire architects. We hire a variety of different people from uh, different disciplines, whether that's uh, coming from an engineering background, whether that's anthropologists, biologists. And I think the idea of bringing in people and looking at uh, challenges that we're facing in the building industry from slightly different angles is, is quite exciting. Uh, we like to think of it as uh, kind of the Swiss army knife of how we, we tackle these challenges from many different angles. But the three main areas that we work on, uh, we have a department that really focuses on circular design, one that looks in digital design and innovation within that area, and then finally, uh, behavioral design and how you know, architecture, oh, sorry, behavior, architecture can shape behavior in, in many ways. Uh, within the GXN team, we like to think we're a little bit of these kind of uh, geeks and nerds that we can go into these small topics and really explore areas which uh, sometimes the architects don't really get to, to, to do. And many of the time for our 3XN designers, it tends to be this kind of a linear process where they can't have too many hiccups along their kind of design to construction phase. So their concept that they come up with inevitably has to turn into to this reality. And I think we're at GXN, we, we get to have a bit of fun. We get to do these kind of wacky and wild tangents and then uh, explore these kind of areas which can then help to inform our architectural team. So circular by design. I think I'm going to talk about a couple of projects. I'm also wary that we're, we're, we're a bit tight for time, so I apologize for, for going through these quite quickly. But um, I just want to start off by saying, you know, well, what is the construction indi industry and what are we accountable for in current uh, situation globally? I mean, we're the, the third industry where we start to look at the consumption of materials is about 35%. The amount of waste we're accountable for is 37 And then, of course, the, the, the global emissions of CO2. It's uh, a responsibility we have, to, we have to really look in the mirror about. And of course, this is something that has been rapidly impacting us in, in the last few years. And you know, it's tricky because when you look at the need and, and the global rise of, of population, the need for houses and living conditions, you know, we are literally moving mountains to be able to find and salvage and get this material to go back into these, these houses. Uh, and I think I really love this uh, image. This is Shanghai from 1987. And this is Shanghai in 2013. And you, you see how quickly we're building these cities, the consumption of concrete, and how much we're using and, and, and emitting. Uh, I think one of the massive areas is that we build these buildings, but not doing it exactly very, very well. I mean, we are designing them with such short lifespans for 20, 30 years, some of these high rises, and inevitably they're just getting just demolished and going to landfill. And yeah, I think this is the attitude that so many of, of designers are taking is that it's all fine, you know, we're just going about our, our business. So I, yeah, I think we have a, a big responsibility to, to change this. Um, so how can we see some of these challenges we're facing as positive drivers for design? And this is something that we think a lot about at GXN. Shifting away from this linear form of, of design and going into this kind of circular economy where we're trying to close the loops on the way that we think about our resources. Um, so a project I'm going to talk about is QQT Tower, which is in Sydney, which is an example of how we've looked at reuse and future adaptability within the proposal. So through this design, we saved around 7,500 tons of carbon uh, CO2 and around 25,000 uh, cubic meters of concrete. Uh, this is equivalent to about 2,500 flights from uh, Sydney to, to Denmark. Um, and so this is the existing building, which is uh, uh, called the AMP building. And we were the only ones in the competition that proposed not to demolish this and actually to look at how we can start to build and harness what is already there. Uh, and this is the kind of the new proposal. We retained 65% of all structural columns, beams, and slabs, but then also uh, retained 98% of structural walls. And I, I'm just going to talk a little bit and quite quickly through how we did this. You know, we compromised and removed part of the existing building. 
We looked at harnessing the, the, the core and the structural integrity that it offered and then started to build upon that for the new proposal. Uh, yeah, this is from the demolition site, uh, if, if, or maybe a year and a half or two years ago, but you can see the relevance of the building with Sydney Opera House and the, the, and the bridge to the left. Um, here's an image of the core system, which we, we, we continue to retain. Uh, we're working demolishing down, but also building up at the same time how we could start to reinforce many of the structural elements uh, from the ground level, and then inevitably starting to build upon this for the design. Here's a time lapse of, of how this was unfolding over, over the years. But, uh, but I think, I'll get to the stat at the end, but this was a process which was very new for Australian market and one which I think now we've, we really pride ourselves on, on our business model of how we work with, with uh, these new high rises. Some images of the, of the new proposal. But I think one thing that was quite interesting is, you know, through this process, we, we saved, you know, I think around 80 million euros on this proposal uh, and, and a, a lot of time as well. And I think one thing that it allowed us to do was create some quite interesting and, and unique parts of the design which looked at adaptable space and how we can, we can evolve with the changing needs. Creating these um, soft spots throughout the building where we could look at having uh, flexible floor plates vertically. So moving away from this typical high rise, but then giving our tenants a lot of this kind of uh, vertical flexibility. And, and one thing that we really worked with is this idea of design for demountability and disassembly. So how through the structural systems and the sizes that they could be um, created at, we could demount this quite easily and, and change depending on program uh, of the future. And these systems can just be bolted in and then are small enough to be able to go up in, 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 the lift, in the lift shafts. And you can see these atrium areas here and inevitably the sort of final twist of, of the design. A lot of what we do is always uh, open sourced and published. So every time we're doing and research around circular design, this is then uh, created into books and publications which you can find online. Uh, not just about this project, but, uh, but every project we work with. This is another uh, a project which we've, we're continuing to work on, a research one, and I think it's quite relevant to what we just heard before by uh, Kaya around the reuse of uh, and looking at the challenges of social housing within in Denmark. Uh, this was a project which was funded by the, the government, but also by uh, Circuit, which is an EU-funded project. And we did, a, again, a publication and research piece into some of the, the challenges and opportunities which you could see within these social housing projects. Uh, I think there's around 70 of these different areas which we were looking into, but we, we selected 15 to be part of our kind of research uh, and analysis. Uh, so a lot of what that did was going back to the start, understanding the, the buildings that have uh, come before and, and also the way that they were constructed and the similarities between them. Um, what we noticed was that a lot of them are, of course, built very much the same. Um, but what has been proposed by the government is that they really want to demolish all these buildings and start to look at ways in which they can build you know, new, uh, new, new, new communities. And we were saying, hey, look, you know, you're going to be demolishing a lot of this and you're going to be building a lot of new, but how can we actually harness what materials are actually there to go back into these new proposals? So we're moving away from this demolition, but also proposing ways in which we can bring that material back in. And I'll explain a few of those. Um, so yeah, we looked at the buildings, the structure, started to, to work with the, the universities and research around what the concrete uh, complexities and DNA is, understanding the materials, understanding the different components. And then I think what was really exciting is we started to look at this building, uh, Volsmosis, and, and start to uh, you know, explode it out, dissect it in, into its separate parts and elements, and started to see these, um, these, uh, these buildings as a bit of a kit of parts that we could design with. Um, we worked with the demolition contractors and engineers on how you could demount this, how you could cut many of these elements out uh, into different slabs, different uh, units. Uh, and then we, we've created a competition with uh, inviting 10 architects from Copenhagen to take all of this material that we unfolded for them and then sort of explored to them saying, well, how can you then you know, create something exciting and interesting out of it? And yeah, there were a lot of really uh, great opportunities to look into hybrid structures, but also using these elements in their one-for-one -one, uh, design. And thinking about the, the ways that we can work with the existing buildings, the different components on how to reintroduce 
systems of joineries, and then you know, the final visualization, how can we excite people about what the potential is moving forward. Am I going for, for time here? I'm just wondering if I should skip this project. Don't skip, okay. Uh, I'll go very quick through this. This was another one, a uh, project called, uh, which I'm focusing around urban upcycling, and, and one I've, I've been working with the last uh, two years or so. And this is based in, in London, in Finsbury Avenue. And I, th I think why we were uh, very much involved in this is there's a lot of new regulations and requirements that are coming out of London at the moment. You know, people are pushing the panic button on uh, what they can get through planning, commission, and not. And what our role as uh, consultants with the 3XN design team was to look at ways in which we can start to uh, think about some of these building materials that are going to be demolished through this project, but bring them back and reintroduce them into the new design. So this is the 3XN proposal, um, which is a 36-story yeah, building, but currently on site is this existing 2FA project, and I think it's such a shame because, personally, I think it's a, a got a lot of, a lot of exciting elements to it. There's a lot of materials which it would be such a shame to be sending to, to landfill. So our role was to look at this material uh, and find ways that we can reintroduce it back into the design and trying to achieve that high po highest possible value for that material uh, in, the in the future. So the first thing we do is we do these pre-demolition audits where we uh, look at every single element of, of that building over a period of a week we see these materials as like material ingredients lists that we could start to uh, create some, some exciting products and designs with. We then create these upcycling catalogs and present a series of ideas to our design team of direct reuse, upcycle, and, and recycle pathways. And then, of course, we, we realize the budget and, 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 uh, and opportunities in terms of program and what is possible within demolition. So we had to select a series of elements and designs that we thought were, were the best ones to pursue. Um, understanding the flows of these materials, how do they get from A to B. Um, but also, uh, what was quite important is the kind of upcycle storytelling. I mean, there's a perception of upcycling that it's a scrapyard and that the values of those materials are going to look a little bit rough around the edges and not so, uh, not so flash to be going into a new high rise. But our job was to say, you know, and show that there's incredible opportunities to, to high end design uh, without, you know, you know, compromising the integrity of it. So I think we wanted to tell the story about how you can see upcycling as a, a sculptural and decorative solution one that you can in interact and engage with from a, from a personal level, those who are coming into the new design. And then also the storytelling, you know, uh, it's new to London, so we realize we have to start at small scale, but you know, how you can actually get and execute this uh, uh, in reality, and, and I think it's also kind of a marketing thing for, for the developer as well. Um, but again, I'm gonna skip through these quite quickly, but we proposed a variety of different options from taking this material, uh, 800 meters squared of it, turning it into these different types of feature walls. We explored different options, uh, played around and, and worked with different manufacturers about the kind of effects and spatial qualities you could get, um, and reintroducing them back into the new proposal. Looking at the product designs, taking the aluminium, creating these locker systems, taking the old sprinkler pipes, turning them into bike racks, uh, different seating areas from the different pipe works the timber into shelving units, taking the, the duct work that you see around the buildings, unfolding them, and then creating this, this cladding that you can put into the, the basement areas, using the uh, you know, ear duct systems as lighting, uh, lighting units. So we had a lot of fun. This was one we're doing where we're taking all the glass, crushing it down, and putting it into uh, this, the social lobby terrazzo mix. We're working with local artisans to find ways that you can create quite beautiful and bespoke upcycled glass elements that can be reintroduced into all the bathrooms in, in the design. Uh, again, I think it's so important to start small, prototype, and then scale. We know this is an idea, it's new for, for London, but we think that, that it's something that we can scale over time. And we need to understand these processes, we need to know the stepping stones that need to be taken, establish relationships with manufacturers and suppliers, Currently, we're in the process of doing these mock-ups, so we're, we're, we're showing the, the integrity of, of, of uh, and making sure it fit, fits certain standards and requirements, um, and then hopefully introducing it. Yeah, so this is a few weeks ago, taking some of this material down. 
and now we're in the kind of manufacturing process. Um, I'm just going to check the time. So, oh, gone all right. Okay. Um, I can slow down a little bit then. Uh, but I think the, the big thing we wanted to try and push with our clients is, you know, of course, there's the, the topic of carbon emissions and the impact that we're having from raw material extractions. But there's also, you know, the, the fact that we are, you know, having issues around um, material access. You know, we're running out of sand. We're running out of uh, a lot of the valuable materials. And, and that hence is getting more and more expensive and very competitive. So we need to try and encourage the, the, the fact that this, this material should be seen as a valuable thing for them over time. And when they're looking at the lifespans of our materials, um, you know, and the amount of projects that our, our, our clients is working with and demolishing and rebuilding, that they need to keep this within their cycle. They need to see this as a valuable resource moving forward. I'm just going to finish on a couple of personal projects that I do on the side from work, but also at the heart of it is focused around circular design, not so much around buildings, but the, the, the processes of, of, and, and the way that we can think about this in a different context. Um, I specialize in a, a architecture within extreme environments. It's what my university uh, back background was. And, and how that kind of works is that I go to different extreme uh, locations, extreme cold and extreme hot environments. And I find uh, and use design, research by design, as a way of which we can explore uh, how to live and survive in these, in these changing contexts and extreme environments. Um, whether that's looking at ways through, again, small prototype scale, you can look at snow as a, a natural insulator for a deployable emergency shelter, how you can create a fresh water source and energy uh, for informal settlement communities that are detached from any formal systems, uh, how you can scale that up into projects where it's looking at community-driven design out of local materials and readily available material uh, uh, objects. And then finally, how we can envision this as, a, as creating these self-sustaining uh, communities of the, of the future in, in many of these South American uh, contexts, but also in other parts of the world. But I'm just going to talk briefly about one of the projects that I um, have done recently. And this was based in a, a informal settlement camp in uh, <clears throat> the Atacama Desert, a place called Mijiones. It's a coastal community where uh, they face many challenges, in particular sanitation, electricity, and water. Um, but for me, it's you know when I go into these locations and I'm working with local NGOs to learn about the conditions before I go there, I also start to think about the opportunities that you have in these extreme places. So. Uh, being a community which is by the coastline, you know, they have an abundance access to solar energy, but also abundant access to seawater. So how can we start to combine many of these in, into this kind of low-tech and passive systems where we start to replicate processes of nature and, and, and try and find ways that we can actually learn from this and recreate it at a smaller scale? Uh, this is the system. It's a solar desalination skylight. You hand pump sea or polluted water into the inner bowl. The solar energy from the, uh, the sun heats up this, this seawater or polluted water. The impurities stay behind, but the, the fresh water is gathered and then trickles down into, into the basin. So very, very simple system. It's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, but trying to take this idea but apply it in a, in a slightly different context. And the idea of creating um, not a resource production system that is detached from the living environment, but very much bringing it part of the home, part of a uh, space, space where you can create this natural diffused light into this. You can create a, yeah, a, a central place for, for uh, the children to do their homework and so forth. But also, again, looking at the circular way of thinking, how we can take the salt brine that is left over from, from the desalination process, put it into a series of these low-tech seawater batteries, and then you can generate a, a, a of energy charge, which is uh, then charged by a solar panel throughout the, the daytime. So yeah, this is a, one of the projects that I've been working with. And I think, again, I use these small scale prototypes as ways in which I can start to learn more about this topic, ways in that we can communicate with the communities, we can, we can hear about some of the challenges, but then work with them to solve some of these or address some of these issues moving forward. And um, I think, yeah, I think, Circular design is, 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 a, is something that we need to be really taking seriously. And unfortunately, there's not enough designers and um, 
uh, and architects out there that are doing it. And I think it's exciting to see uh, some of the, the proposals in this uh, architecture uh, comp uh, awards that are really looking at this seriously. And I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's, we can learn and we can share a lot of this knowledge. And I think we need to, uh, we need to push a lot more people to, to be addressing this. But hopefully I didn't run too over time, but I would love to chat more about this with anyone that wants to uh, speak more. Um, again, our, our company, 3XN, GXN, you can find a lot of the publications online. Uh, and I'm also happy to share with you if you'd like. So thank you very much. Is this working? Where is it? Hello? Good? Um, okay, hi everyone. Um, yeah, it's been, a real, it's been a real pleasure dashing all over the whole of Latvia. I've been to Latvia maybe like 10 times or something. I have a bit of a connection here, but um, I think I've seen more of it in the last two days. Um, definitely seen a lot more of it in the last two days than uh, I did in the last 10 trips. Um, I am going to show you, I'm a, so my name is Tom Randall Page, I'm an architect, designer um, and educator. I, I'm based in London um, and I, I grew up in, in the Devon countryside. I'm going to show you a couple of projects from my practice which um, are both uh, incredibly slow, long projects that I've taken many, many years to, to produce in a very sort of uneconomic way. Um, but I, th I think they're both projects that have kind of benefited from that very, very long gestation period um, and both projects that I'm incredibly kind of fond of. So um, I'm going to start with um, Art Barn. Um, so this is this is Dartmoor. This is the this kind of Highland region, Dartmoor National Park, um, which this is the kind of photo that the tourist board would show you, um, and it's seen. You know, if if you don't know about it uh, in general, then uh, it tends to be sort of viewed as a as a sort of wilderness area, um, uh, very 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 wild and unspoiled. But uh, in, in fact, this is a bit of a lie, and uh, this used to be a forest on the very old maps, still called Dartmoor Forest, and this was felled in the kind of Neolithic period for, for fuel and has been incredibly degraded, uh, the land. And this is on the edge of Dartmoor National Park. This is uh, Drogo Castle by, um, by Edwin Lutchins, uh, the architect of, of New Delhi. It's the youngest castle in Britain, and the last building in Britain made, uh, built from solid granite. And this is the, the Teen Valley Gorge, which the, the castle sits the head of, um, which also is kind of, on first impressions, a, a kind of wild place, uh, just a, a natural forest. But uh, you don't have to look very far back. In fact, even within uh, you know, the time in which we've had photography, and you can find images of it almost clear felled. And you kind of realize that many and many of these things that you presume to be natural are actually the results of man-made processes and, and are actually manufactured landscapes. So I, through my work and where I've come from and my teaching, I've become kind of interested in, in, in the rural condition and the countryside, how it's viewed. And these are images from um, uh, AMO's uh, countryside uh, kind of study and uh, it's, it's, this is a typical kind of news agent newsstand and uh, here we are kind of looking at the amount of that uh, newspaper stand that seems to be in some way devoted to the countryside or a vision of the countryside some kind of mythology of the countryside um, and in the UK that tends to be you know it's, it's all kind of country houses and cream teas and uh, horse riding and maybe a bit of like mountain biking and um, uh, lots of kind of uh, beautiful pictures of, of, of animals in, in, in fields and um, good food and things like that. 
But the kind of reality of what happens in the countryside is a lot more complex than that. It's not all kind of farming and um, some kind of historical uh, naive uh, image of, 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 the, of life. But actually, these are, this is a strip of land that they, they, they studied in, I think it's in Holland, or it might be in Belgium. But um, from the air, it kind of looks just like farmland. Uh, it's all fields, it seems. But they, they studied like what is actually happening in all of those buildings. And they begin to categorize it as, as genuine farms, but then also as, as uh, pseudo farms, uh, and then uh, non farms. So many, many, many of these things are going on in, you know, in agricultural spaces or buildings that were designed for agriculture. Um, but actually, they, they kind of say in conclusion to this project that, that there's just the same amount of diversity in the countryside, in this countryside. It's just spread a bit thinner than it is in the city. So people are doing all the, all the same things. And this is a kind of introduction to um, this first project. So that, that's me, that little boy, who's excited about the water coming out of the stone. And that's, that's my dad. And we moved to the countryside when I was three. My dad's a sculptor, and he was looking for space to make work. Uh, he couldn't afford to stay in London anymore. And uh, so he bought a farm with no land farmhouse and barns and uh, converted them into, into art studios, or didn't really convert them at all, just used them for art studios. So we had immediately a, a, a pseudo farm. Um, this is the kind of work that he makes. Um, he's kind of, I mean, he makes all sorts of work, but he, he, he's known for making quite large stone sculptures. Um, well, stone sculptures of various sizes, actually. And this is the kind of spaces that he works in. So this is a kind of attic space in an, an old agricultural building, which he's converted to uh, draw in and um, study in a way. So that's there. That's where my family house is, where I grew up. And then this is the Teen Valley, uh, an unusually steep and deep gorge for, for, for Devon countryside. And this is Castle Drogo. And this other red dot up here is, uh, is this uh, barn that we, we bought. Um, zooming in on that area. So basically, my dad felt like he was, he was outgrowing some of the space that he had in, in the, uh, around our, our farm, and that he needed a space that would be a dedicated archive, as he's very prolific, making a lot of work. And he's done that for decades. There's a lot of storage needed. So this barn is a modern building, and it sits on the edge of the forest. Um, this is the river running down here, and this is this kind of steep forest which can't really be farmed. Uh, and then where it's a bit shallower, you've got a kind of patchwork of farmland. And then these gatherings of houses, this is actually a furniture maker. This is actually, um, this is actually another artist. Uh, this is a retired doctor. So they are kind of look like farms, but they aren't. So this is the barn that we, we bought, an agricultural building which uh, had agricultural use class. But of course, as soon as you buy it, if you're not a farmer, it's not really agricultural anymore, it seems. Um, but we applied for change of use for it to be a store. And my dad gave me a very nice brief uh, that he wanted an archive and drawing studio and a, a place that could be completely closed up and you wouldn't know it wasn't a barn or a, an agricultural building. So in two, I started this project in 2011, um, and uh, over a weekend in 2011, made a, made a big model and uh, started to explore ideas about how this space could be converted. Um, farmers know very well how, uh, they're very pragmatic, and they know about climate. Uh, this is the southwest uh, corner of the building, which is as you can see, extremely closed, because that's where the prevailing wind comes from and the rain in the UK. Um, and this is the east face, where we very rarely get uh, weather from the east. So this is where the entrance was, and you can see there was, there, was no, um, there was no hard standing, there's no foundation, really. It's all just kind of cow shit. Um, so th this is what the original uh, barn looked like in profile. It's a very simple uh, timber frame building. 
um, very minimal and lightweight and cheap. Uh, hardly any foundations, kind of cut and fill into the landscape. And then this is the proposed section, so keeping exactly the same envelope shape, the same primary structure inside it. Um, and then just building in from, from that outside surface, even though we did actually, over, we did actually uh, reclad a lot of it. So spatially, I'll just go quickly through the plan. Um, you have one main uh, open space, which is a gallery and uh, storage space for sculptures and a place where you can essentially show work and bring clients. Uh, this is the archive, this long uh, strip uh, space to the north, which is highly insulated, um, no windows, um, very heavily built and uh, has its own dehumidification. And then here you have like a little uh, insulated pod called the Winter Studio, and this is a workshop and a compost loo, and this kind of strip along the front does a lot of um, functions I'll explain. Going down uh, half a level, um, well, going down, yeah, half a level from the main space and a full level from the Winter Studio, you have a kind of double height space in this corner which, where, where, where you enter the building, a little snug under here with a, with a wood-burning stove, and then this is the plant room. And uh, this is it in three dimensions, so you can understand. One of the um, organizing principles was to kind of formalize the level change with this retaining wall that, that comes from the landscape, where it's kind of terrace in the land, creating flat landscape. Uh, it comes into the building and, and wraps around to create this double height space and allow two stories. This wall was um, much talked about, uh, much discussed between the two of us, and uh, eventually I, I, I just said to my dad, look, you're, you're a stone guy, this is, uh, it's gotta be a stone wall and it's gotta be a, a really good one. Um, so we, we looked for uh, the most local source of stone. Um, it's very important to me to kind of maintain a local character through the materials that you use. Um, so this is a, a quarry that was abandoned, and it's actually the one that was used for Castle Drogo. But it, was, it stopped use in the 70s, and it's, it's very close to the, to the site. So we, we went there, and I went there with the fantastic stone waller that um, my dad's got a working relationship with for, for many years. Um, and we, we bought uh, spoil, we bought waste stone from the quarry, um, where you can basically kind of dig it up uh, you can see it's all under the underground here, and we bought it just by the ton, and we picked stones one by one. And we had many, many discussions about what makes a good stone wall, why some are so beautiful, and some can be so ugly, and lots of discussions about why, why is that, what are the rules, what are the implicit rules within walling that make some good and some not. The project was only possible uh, to do a project in this way because we, we did it without a main contractor. We basically built it ourselves. And um, this guy, PJ, was my dad's studio manager and he project managed the project and built a large amount of it himself. And um, in that way, it was almost a kind of medieval type of uh, process of making a building where it's, there was no contracts. It was all based on reputation and long-standing relationships. This is the beginning of that wall. Um, the first stone we laid, which is quite big, 3.7 tons, and, uh, and the beginning of, a, of one part of the replaced primary structure. This is the only column we replaced, uh, and my dad. <laughs> and um, one of the rules that we, we gave Jez was that we wanted all of the, the waller was that we wanted all of the front faces of the wall to be um, natural broken faces, um, and we didn't want to see any mortar on the surface. Um, so he's working some of the stones, but only behind where you can see it. So it's almost kind of Inca kind of uh, wall making. And it's, of course, it's structural. It's not, there's nothing about cladding in this. Um, 
And you can also maybe see this line here. We, we build a wall slightly tall, and then we struck a line, and then we worked the stones down to a surface. So you get this very crisp top. And then this wall exits the building and into the landscape and becomes a terrace. Um, the building is uh, totally off-grid, so it's, it's got solar PVs on the roof, and it's got uh, rainwater collection um, and rainwater storage and har harvesting. And, um, and that led us to some interesting kind of thermal strategy that um, the archive is, is, is not heated, but it has dehumidification from the batteries from the solar panels. The rest of the space is, is, is basically unheated. And then this one pod is, is the warm space that you can, you can go there and you can very quickly make that warm with a little stove. This allowed us to um, single glaze the whole building. It's a very cheap project, actually. The wall was expensive, but we built this for around 800 pounds a square meter, which is crazy cheap. And uh, so all of these large areas of glazing, they're all single glazing, and we designed all the window frames just from standard steel sections and had them galvanized in an agricultural steel uh, workers. So this is how the building looked from the southwest. This is how it looks now. With the shutters all shut, you can see it's almost, almost the same, incognito. And from the east, and how it looks now uh, with the shutters shut. The only clue is the sculpture. So going back inside to look at the winter studio, I've always loved these um, paintings of St. Jerome in his study, and uh, in these kind of spaces which are part architecture, part furniture, designed specifically for, um, for work and study. Um, soft spaces within larger, harder spaces. And this is how we conceptualized the, the winter studio. It's also like an animal inside this old agricultural building. It has four legs, and it has hooves, and it has a woolly coat. And the woolly coat is made from cork, which is another kind of very sustainable, renewable material, very good insulation from Portugal. And uh, because the building is shuttered most of the time um, to the outside, uh, we utilize a lot of skylights um, for different spaces. So there's a sort of strip skylight for the workshop, this kind of oculus on the double height space, this really big skylight for the gallery, and then this smaller one in a light chimney for the drawing board space. This oculus was a late addition and designed so that the pool of light kind of travels across the floor to highlight this uh, column connection in the, in the midsummer. So this is a view from looking inside now, and uh, this is that column I was talking about and the oculus. And uh, at this stage, we didn't have the balustrade or the stairs, and, and one of the real luxuries of this project was being able to go back uh, quite frequently and design on-site and design the next bit in the space and kind of take it very, very slow. So, so here I was kind of designing the, this balustrade that I realized I sort of needed to have. Um, uh, in the space. And this balustrade is like a removable, very simple steel element, which is removed with just two bolts. And then this is a very lightweight steel stair, which is just hooked onto the wall and can be lifted away. And all of these details, all these galvanized details, they're all kind of like handmade, bespoke, designed, but very, very simple, made by the agricultural steel worker. This is what the, the winter studio looks like now. And uh, with its, it has kind of double glazing, but it uh, doesn't have to deal with the weather, so it's just kind of held on with little clips. And inside, um, it has this kind of ply-lined one end and its own little stove and a, a single uh, work surface, which is a desk one side and a standing desk the other. It has a tail, <laughs> which comes off uh, the back and supports this little hung staircase, which turns into a staircase in the end of the retaining wall. This is the retaining wall uh, heading out into the landscape and uh, the open corner when the agricultural shutters are, are drawn back. 
I've always loved these connections in, you get them a lot in, in, in traditional Nordic buildings, also in, in Japanese buildings. These are Japanese kind of pad stones. And we had a lot of fun with how you can design these. These are, these are based on the, the uh, radius of the angle grinder blade. So they're very simply made. And this is a slightly more complex carved detail, uh, just a gravity fit connection uh, in the main column here. So this is the closed and open version from this side. This is the, the location in the Teen Valley and uh, the south facade. And then there's a little film quickly. Okay, how am I doing? I got time for another one quickly. Um, uh, this is a project that I've literally just finished. I'm going to film it on Tuesday. Um, this is Cody Dock, which is in East London. 
This is a dock. This is the Lee River, London's second river. Um, it runs down from like the Olympic Park uh, down to the Thames. And there's a very sort of long-standing project to try and open up a footpath along the edge of that, which is almost done after 30 years. But all the different landowners made it incredibly difficult. And this was an industrial dock that got left behind by all the Docklands redevelopment. Um, and it was dammed in the, in the 70s and filled with rubbish. And uh, there's a, now a community project which I've been involved with for seven years to empty it and refill it with water, reflood it to the, dock, to the, to the River Lee, and to have large-scale moorings and, a, and a, um, a new dry dock for boat repairs and loads of artist studios here. And this uh, here is the, the bridge, and uh, it's a replacement for a dam which currently blocks the dock. I've always loved these um, infrastructures, these low-tech infrastructures that you, you get all over um, the canal network. Um, and you can lift a boat with sort of no effort at all. And um, basically, I heard from someone that the client was building a bridge there and that he was building quite a boring standard off-the-peg product opening bridge. And uh, I went and asked him, can I, can, I, can I come up with something new for you? And uh, he said, oh, I've already got planning, but you know, if you don't want to be paid, then knock yourself out. You know, obviously, I want to be paid, but not for the first idea. Um, so I, I went away with a friend of mine uh, traveling on the canal boat, actually, for two weeks. And I was thinking, there's all these different ways that bridges can open, and there, there must be another one. Um, and I used to work for this guy, and he, he invented another one, but it's kind of a bit of a nuts one. Uh, very, very, very high tech, and uh, relies on like computer-controlled things and lots of hydraulics, and it's it's kind of the opposite of this one here, where, where it's all like the most basic counterweighted system possible. This one is like lifting at arm's length the bridge up like this. Um, and I was kind of more interested in the one on the right. Um, this guy in the 60s uh, did this maths that defined what the shape of these humps are so that you could actually have a bike with square wheels, and you could cycle along this very specially designed track, and, uh, and it would roll as well as a, as a round wheel. Um, obviously, this is, you know, where are those tracks? <laughs> this is completely useless. But I liked the idea, and I also knew that you could have asymmetric uh, or eccentric um, cog wheels. And if, if you have a pair that go together, they, can, they don't need to be circular. Is what's important is that the center of gravity moves horizontally or the pivot point stays still. So I started to think about this bridge, um, which was square but rolled. And uh, so it had a special track like this, and then it could roll over to allow boats to go underneath. So you walk across here, and then boats go through here. And I made a model. I talked to some engineers. They got very excited about it. And I, and I worked with a, a stop frame animator to, to make a little film to check that this works. Of course, there's things you can lie about in animation that uh, don't work in real life. But um. So we made this little film, and we started to raise money. And we got planning permission. And the client loved the project. And, um, then the project was stalled for about four years, and uh, I thought maybe it was dead. And then suddenly, my client phoned me up and said, we've got the funding, let's go. And he'd managed to get some public funding. And then, uh, and then with this public money, as it is, uh, it's like you wait for four years, and then they give you the money, and they say, hey, you have to spend it by the end of the year. So it's, suddenly, it's completely insane. So I have sketchbooks full of. These are all uh, versions of the profile interface between the bridge and the, and the abutment, trying to work out how, how on earth does this actually work. This, this uh, version with the rolling actually on the cog uh, wasn't going to work uh, once we got some calculations going. And eventually, we, we, we decided to, to separate the bearing surface from the surface which interfaces and stops any racking. 
So we have kind of tubes and uh, little teeth that go between them, and then a, a flat bearing surface. And then the balustrades also developed from the original design, and, and I, I took inspiration from these amazing you know, rebar cages you find when you're on site. Um, and these standard rebar, this very evolved technology of, of bending, bending bars, and created this kind of prototype of a kind of woven balustrade. Then here, this is um, once we're already in, in, in the process and everything's laser cut and they start to weld it together on site. This is uh, workshops in London. It's literally the biggest thing they could possibly get in the workshop. Um, it had to go in two harvests to get out the door. And these are the tracks being... Uh, fabricated. So here, here we are in, in installing uh, the, the steel tracks, and um, then they're cast in, in, in concrete abutments. And then the, the bridge itself arrived in four pieces. You can see here the oak on the, this wood on the corners is not uh, just for protection. This is actually the rolling surface of the bridge. And uh, it's steam bent oak. And they, they bolt the elements together. It's a central splice. And this is putting the tops of the hoops on. These hoops are, are full of uh, concrete and, and uh, scrap steel. Um, and that, that's in order to counterweight the, the weight of the deck. So your center of gravity is, is, is right in the middle here of the, of the hoop, as it should be, to move horizontally with the minimal effort. The, the, one of the important things about this bridge design also was that it's like the locks in the canal. It's hand-powered, so you, you can just turn a handle. And it, it moves slowly, very slowly, but it moves. So this is how it uh, looks now. Um, I don't have a nice fancy film of it rolling, but I can show you some details. Um, it's now, uh, it's all core 10 steel, so it's beginning to um, become part of this kind of derelict uh, dock uh, collage of, of different aged pieces. It's the balustrade and the edge of the deck. And then uh, the way that it rolls along that track. You can see just this one cable here. This is what pulls it, um, just an eight mil cable. Um, and the balustrades are designed in such a way that they can fold flat down, so they can hinge on this point, and they can be bolted down to the deck, so you get an extra 80 mil of clearance if you have a very high boat. And I have a, a video from the iPhone, so <laughs> this is just one of the test rolls. Okay, thanks very much. Hello. Yes, I think uh, it's a little bit difficult for me to show a lot of uh, our work because uh, the biggest work we've did is the this one you probably know it's fails and it's success partial i hope so i will tell about our uh, most recent and ongoing work uh, which somehow relates to this because uh, it happened that uh, maybe we got some expertise in in, in some of the heritage field and existing buildings and museums that we tried bridges, we tried everything else, but somehow only the public build, old public buildings work for us. Uh, Kona's Town Hall, it was a strange, very low budget project for Kona City Museum. Basically the task was that uh, it's the 
very old building uh, from go go Gothic be beginning. Uh, it was one floor, then then burned, then again one floor, then two floors, then and around 1780 it was sort of in sort of kind of this shape, but still was modified all the time. And now it looks like this uh, after many, many uh, renovations. And that's why I called uh, our, my sort of presentation the sort of uh, post-modernization. Because bu uh, buildings like that are already so changed, so modified, uh, especially during Soviet times, that it is really difficult to find a sort of a good way how to deal with them, how to update them in a sort of modern, uh, nowadays way. And the problem with this one uh, was that it sort of was structurally fine and, and, and usable and, and sort of nice. But uh, uh, Kaunas City had a Kaunas Museum uh, initiative that they wanted to expand and create, almost create from new. They had it, but they wanted to expand uh, Kaunas City Museum. And because this building already had a uh, representation function, the metrication, the weddings uh, happening here all the time, they needed a little bit more space, more uh, better usage of the existing building. And the building is because of its history was really complicated. This is the drawing we found from Gibarta Simonaitis, who was a, a restoration architect who worked uh, from just after the war. They started in the 50s. And uh, this is his research in, in the early 70s about what happened to the building. And he was doing the renovation because the, the, the town hall had a quite serious structural problems. It, it, it cracked in several uh, key areas uh, near the tower and so on. So he, he did big investigation and then he did quite radical uh, uh, sort of renovation of this building. Uh, he dug up the underground level, which was all filled in. He made huge concrete uh, uh, like uh, concrete uh, elements to s to strengthen everything to s to get it uh, together somehow and also he did another interesting thing uh, at that time in the 70s uh, it was important for restoration projects to find the like sort of national identity and uh, uh, Grand Duchy of Lithuania heritage, basically earlier than the Tsarist uh, division of uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And they worked in this system that they recreated only the uh, earlier periods up to, up to 18th century. But in that way, they removed some of the like later uh, 19th century elements and, and structures. So this was quite radically removed. You can see the concrete, uh, concrete uh, roof, sort of seas, uh, floor, floors were installed, removing the wooden ones. And the effect of it was quite a strange combination of this kind of spaces that it's very difficult uh, to understand from what period they come from. Some of them were quite genuinely old and uh, preserving all the detail and all that. But some of them were sort of made to look like some kind of renaissance or some kind of very old spaces. But in fact, they were built fully in the 70s. Walls, floors, everything. You can see that little bit is old, but most of it is like new with the new brick. But but also they kept most beautiful 19th century, early 19th century space, the, 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 the main hall on the second floor and the main hall where the weddings and ceremonies take part, take place. And so some nice detail they, they had. Because the Simonites thought maybe that uh, like a, 
in the 16th century, 17th century, it was something like uh, the, the, the traders gathered here, it was a court hall, so they should have, must have had like something, in the Netherlands they had, this is the from Andorfini portrait from Van Eyck, so they made a sort of copy of, of those, and they are still there, we will keep them. But for us, uh, when we investigated the building, it was clear that only way that we can fit this extra museum function was to somehow use the attic, which was really, really impressive uh, space. Sort of half used, half modified. The existing structure was very old from the uh, beginning of 19th century. It was full of engineering networks from Soviet time and later ones. So we, we sort of, basically the scheme was very simple. The, before it was used just partially the ground floor and the like first floor and all other spaces were either unused, either used for administration and so on. And we proposed to use basically more of it. And now it's, uh, it's uh, just from last week, uh, we just tried to open up, so removing some partitions to open up in key areas the space that it becomes again historically more, sort of what it was in the beginning as a market, more transparent, more open. We changed the floors, but of course the problem, even maybe more than we had here in Riga, that it's so regulated in heritage uh, protection terms that we have to put back the tiled floors uh, despite we had like 70s uh, tiles and all uh, we keep the 70s lamps and so on. It is pretty, pretty strict. So we, we cannot do more and I think these spaces will maybe look even worse when we finish than they look now. <laughs> so I think that's the sort of uh, top, uh, top uh, sort of, uh, we found some like uh, quite good 70s uh, channels for, for, for piping and so on. So it was quite easy to do. And so of course we keep the main, main thing, the main hall the, with the, all the chandeliers and, and all that. And the attic uh, is really nice, uh, but the museum wanted to make it uh, sort of highly usable and now the attic is cold. It's sort of uh, can be ventilated naturally. Uh, so we had to design a complicated stair with all the fire requirements that is sort of open here and sort of then it's a tunnel, then you enter the, uh, the attic. So I'm not sure how this will work uh, because we had like 10 times less budget than in, in Riga in big museum. <laughs> so only 3.2 million to do it. And also we had experience with, with uh, Maxless museums and sort of it is effective space, interesting and nice, and I see that artists sort of seem to love it, but it was very expensive and sort of quite brutal intervention actually, because we had to insulate the whole thing to keep the climate, we have to make floors that support big loads uh, for public use and so on. So we tried another method this time, we, we thought maybe, okay, pavilion, warm pavilion, glass pavilion, inside uh, wooden structure and also we needed this because we can use this for the uh, climate for lower parts. It was sort of less visible uh, space that we can use. So we wanted this kind of effect that you can sort of uh, see the existing thing but also have warm and, and useful space that the museum can use. We had to install quite a lot uh, of uh, steel elements that had to be modular to, to sort of uh, insert them through the small gaps in the roof, uh, not to, to, to take big beams, uh, was difficult. And then we made a floor. It's really from, from weeks ago. The floor is already here. It's just a, like a steel frame and concrete and it can support the weight. And then we are now installing the, the thin steel, custom-made steel beams that are, this is the short part, but then it goes down like 12 meters between, between the supporting uh, uh, chimneys that we use for support. 
and then it will be glass and it will be like uh, good for uh, exhibition lighting tracks and so on. So it's really quite simple but quite challenging to make uh, and we had to, we, we, at first we wanted to use like wood but it was not possible due to fire, due to loads, so we switched to steel and we tried it to make it as thin as possible. So now it's under construction, we hope it will be quite dramatic space, interesting. Also the, like this, uh, underneath the pavilion and this lower, lower part below the wooden structure, we will need for ventilation and we will need it to be cold to, to have a, like heat exchange machines and so on because it's the building doesn't have any backyard, any back backstage. So we we will put some of the most of the climate related ventilation and other equipment under the under this uh, pavilion under here and, and it will be just a little bit visible but but the main the main space will be sort of cold and we ventilate it naturally how it is now. So that's the only very much in progress, so, so we hope uh, uh, next year we will have it finished. And the other project in, in the very much the same vein is the big renovation project. Uh, we won a big competition last year. It was like a similar competition, 35 inches or so. For the National Museum of Art, they have a Janusz Radvila Palace complex, complex of buildings that, that also need, that are, have complicated history and need renovation. And it's the competition entry, but maybe I'll start from this with the story as well. It is sort of very old building, but sort of unsuccessful in its own way. It was designed by Jan Ulrich, who was a, a big architect at the time, who worked with Radvila family, who was uh, sort of one of the, uh, Janusz Radvila was the governor of Vilnius in, 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 in like 1640s, 1650s. And he commissioned the building and started building, but um, unfortunately, uh, building never got built fully because this is the medal that Sebastian Dadler made like a and it's the only image that we have of the of the palace how it was like with five towers you can see the uh, castle on the top you can recognize the most of the other churches and uh, and other spaces in Vilnius but it was outside the city this is the city wall and s somehow Later, just basically when it was under construction, this happened. You see the Kiev, Chernigiv, uh, I mean the same names, almost the same maps as now. This is the war between Russia and um, uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth at that time, which was like this. And uh, in 16... 12 or 14, we burned down the Moscow. But then, uh, sort of, they came and sort of, <laughs> it's called the Battle of Vilnius because you can see that they managed to somehow take, take for the first time Vilnius and it was brutally robbed, killed and burned down. And uh, it continued for many years. Uh, before Lithuanian uh, 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 governors were able to kick the Russians out, uh, like after 20 years. So you can imagine everything was destroyed. And this unfinished palace, half-finished palace, was also one of the victims. And you can see that in 1840, it's, it's here, it's almost unrecognizable. It's vaguely sort of there, parts of it, but unclear. And then, after that, uh, grand, 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 grand kid of Janusz Radvila uh, sort of donated the, the palace uh, for the Labdaribes uh, sort of uh, 
for the, basically for development. And during the 19th century, this happened. This is the structure. This is the pieces of, of uh, palace, and the everything else was just a, became a typical old town uh, station. This is the, do, just after the war, one, Leiklo Street and Vilnius Street. You will recognize this later. So all of that was demolished just after the war, early 50s. Then, in 65, much of it gone, but the palace bit remained, but most film came to film the film, to Vilnius, and then just use it as a uh, backstage sort of, and blew it up, the remaining bit, which was a sort of nice chapel, and, uh, and it's like for two seconds maybe, five seconds in the film, but uh, there it was, this is the remaining building. And then some kind of 60s poverty, the, some of it was converted much earlier. This bit is very old, it's sort of oh, what has the Renaissance, half Baroque, half Renaissance facade, but it was converted in three floors already in 1805, and then it was used and used for 200 years. So, and of course then after this, it stand, uh, stood like this a long time, and then in the 90s, before 90s, it was a sort of national revival, and uh, dreams were popping up to renew it, rebuild it, and so on, but never really materialized fully, just partially, because this is the palace sort of uh, area. This is old, untouched, basically, from the early 19th century, just uh, sort of repair, and, and uh, this, is, uh, this is more or less original up to second floor, and this is also strongly renovated, but still with original uh, bits, and this is completely new from the, from the foundations. And this one is from similar building as you have a lot in Riga, from 1912, uh, it was a theater, it was quite interesting. And then we had a lamp factory, which then became a Jewish theater, and then became and the interrogation room, and then sports hall, and some other buildings back there. And then you have a massive uh, space of nothingness in the middle, which is parking and some kind of uh, indescribable location. That, and that was the goal of the competition, to somehow make this uh, into a some kind of readable uh, form. So, public space, some trees. And our idea was to take almost a mythical palace, just from archaeology and uh, Dudler Medal, combine it with uh, early 20th century, 19th century additions, and sort of make a hybrid this building sort of becomes this, but also part, partly perimeter building, so it's transformed, and the same as in the middle, and just add the missing bit to connect functionally and connect it sort of into whole, uh, into a readable sort of uh, proposal. And then to cover up the underground, existing underground uh, excavations just with a, a sort of landscape uh, design which li little bit reminds of the former courtyards, just a little bit of structure. And that's what we made. We wanted to just make this a uh, sort of active zone here with more trees, maybe some little bit nuanced uh, uh, landscape to cover up the existing foundations and basements of the of the former former buildings and then lower this part about one meter lower to create 17th century level at which the ground floor of existing buildings are and also connect all the buildings to into single single uh, single building facades you can sort of we played with this now we are working on this project with this kind of 
maybe a little bit problematic shape, but uh, but we like the idea that it's sort of uh, already bones already with the scar is born with the scars that it's not full, the tower is not full, but it's sort of half half because we don't want to destroy the 1805 edition. Um, public space. This is the one of the main old town streets. Very busy. A lot of bars. A lot of cafes. So it will be quite uh, intensively used. And the inner part is more of a museum museum space. Gravel. We we hope we can get the gravel square like it was. And this building also is partially renovated. This part will return more or less to two floors and then sort of less and less and less and then completely without without plaster. And also the facades, it is sort of collage of different, uh, very different uh, uh, textures and, and, and uh, but most of it is plastered, so our sort of concrete grid that we want to make corresponds like little bit with the overall shape and the details of the of the design and also we can control the uh, light which is also very important for us uh, like minimize where in, we, we need it also the this central bit will be very important to connect everything to connect the former lamp factory to connect the floors, to have a conference space, to have like connection between buildings, some archives, maybe some archives underneath. And so this is very much under 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 development. So it's it's not a final view, just a competition renderings. But we have very nice also inner spaces that we are working on. These all buildings are from different uh, different uh, ages. To, from in Soviet times, they were quite heavily modified. So we have to sort of consider what what is what. Also consider the climate requirements that museum has. And uh, but the space is very nice in this uh, lamp factory. We, we, we will try everything to keep it and to keep it almost as it is with the, all the historic. Uh, space frame structure and the Soviet lights, uh, la windows, but maybe a little bit better insulation and better technically. Also, the old buildings have really in some nice places, which is a sort of mixed, mix of old, original from 1660s, the vault, but with Soviet corresponding, <laughs> corresponding terrazzo. Also, again, attics, but also part of it is used and, and with great effect because uh, our friends Patrice Ishor on, on Lazaritita made incredible exhibition for Soviet era rebel art. You should visit if you will be in Vilnius. Fantastic exhibition, fantastic uh, art. So. It's, it will be such some kind of modification rather than radical intervention in, in, in other places, just a more engineering task than a sort of design task. But of course, some spaces will be new and sort of the connection will have to be made and sort of these later renovations and earlier renovations will have to be some kind of merged together. Thank you.